I'm I'm curious about the uh, showboat the the um, the Kobe Bryant life of Kobe Bryant. Maybe in in maybe in maybe you could give me an overview what this book. Well, we all know it's about Kobe. Okay, so I mean, what's right. the it it really uh, seeks to explain a lot of things that were mysteries about Kobe. And things that Kobe never bothered really to clear all that much up about himself mm -hmm. or his family. Um, how he became a Laker right out of high school. How he um, struggled. All the different things that went on that led to him being Kobe Bryant as a NBA star. And one thing that people didn't know, and this came up in the news recently, um, Kobe Bryant, uh, his parents were, um, his father had played eight years in the NBA and then eight years in Europe. And when Magic Johnson announced that he was HIV positive, that really rocked the Bryant family because Kobe's father, Joe Jelly Bean Bryant, idolized Ma Magic Johnson. Kobe's dad was almost 6'10", where Magic was almost 6'9". Kobe's dad played a showboating style. He, he could do a lot of the things with the ball. He sort of played point guard in high school, sort of played point guard, point forward um, in college at LaSalle for Paul Westhead, who later coached Magic with the Lakers. And so uh, Jelly Bean was not a real serious guy. He had a lot of fun. Um, he, crowds loved him, particularly in Europe. And he had been on the Philadelphia 76ers on what was called the bomb squad, mm. the young players that would come off the bench in Philly and try to shoot lots of shots and have sort of a showboating style. And so Jelly Bean later played for both Houston and the L.A. Clippers before he finished eight years of his career in Italy where Kobe grew up as a child and sort of learned to play while dominating a lot of his Italian playmates in basketball. Mm -hmm. And so when the, the, the Bryant family always had an elevated lifestyle, they had a, a uh, fabulous place where they lived at various places in Italy. They always had the best of everything. Excuse me. But when they got back to this country, they were in a little bit of financial trouble. The only job Joe Bryant could find was as an assistant girls JV basketball coach at the Jewish Community Center in, uh, in the Lower Marion area. And that's certainly... I've been a JV bas high school basketball coach. Mm -hmm. Even the head coach doesn't make much money. So the one of the narratives of the Bryant family became, how are we going to have this lifestyle uh, now that Joe is no longer playing pro basketball? And so Kobe had wanted to go to college Mm -hmm. But as Sonny Vaccaro explained to me, Sonny Vaccaro had been fired by Nike and was working for Adidas. And Sonny had this goal of stealing. He wanted vengeance mm -hmm. against the NCAA and against Nike. He wanted to steal the next great player from Nike, and he wanted to steal that player from college basketball. He wasn't thinking that player would be Kobe Bryant. He'd never heard of Kobe. He knew Joe mm -hmm. uh, Jellybean Bryant because when Joe was in uh, high school senior in 1972, he had played in Sonny Vaccaro's All-Star Game. Anyway, Joe brought his young son Kobe to Sonny's camp when 
Kobe was a high school sophomore, and that marked the coming out of Kobe Bryant because Sonny Vaccaro realized this is it. This is the next great guy. And so they began following and tracking Kobe, and they used uh, AAU coach Gary Charles in, in, uh, in and around uh, the Northeast United States to keep a track on Kobe. And three years later, Kobe's a senior. He's had a great senior year. They won a state championship. Um, and lo and behold, Sonny starts pulling the strings to get Kobe recognized and drafted. And they they get Kobe a tryout. Kobe wasn't, you know, he's a guard. He's a basically a 17-year-old kid still at the time. They were, nobody was screaming Kobe Bryant. I mean, that he would he was a good, really good player, but nobody was thinking NBA. People didn't do that at that age. They didn't go into the NBA much back then. At that age, and so Jerry West saw him and loved it, loved him. But uh, in the spring of Kobe's senior year, he had to sign a contract with Adidas that meant he couldn't go to college. And Kobe wanted to go to college. Now, he was full of bravado. I can play NBA. And, you know, Kobe had that kind of moxie. But he looked at Sonny Vaccaro, and Sonny explained this to me. Sonny recalled it clearly. They were at an Italian restaurant in New York. And he said, Mr. Vaccaro, is there any way that I can sign this contract and my parents can have this money? And I can go play college ball. And Sonny had to say, no, I'm sorry, Kobe. If you sign this contract, you're a pro. Got to go play pro ball. Well, uh, that's one of the stories people didn't realize, this whole narrative that the Bryant family needed money. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing is the people got really mad at Kobe. It was a terrible situation. He was supposed to be drafted by Charlotte. Sonny Vaccaro, in getting Jerry West to look at Kobe, had set it up so that the Lakers would trade for Kobe in the draft and get him from Charlotte. And uh, everybody assumed Kobe had set this up, that Kobe's family had, had pulled all these strings. That wasn't Kobe or his family at all. They didn't even learn about it till the night of the draft. And so everybody's saying, Kobe's this spoiled kid. You know, he, he got blasted in Charlotte. He was sort of blasted in Philadelphia, his hometown. And the amazing thing to me was Kobe, you know, I spent a lot of time with him in those early years after he got to the NBA. And Kobe could have corrected this at any time. And he never bothered to even explain it. Mm -hmm. And the reason he never explained it, he didn't care. He cared about one thing. What do you think that was? Money? Kobe, no. He cared about basketball. Okay. He didn't even want the money from turning pro. He wanted to go play college. Mm -hmm. Tex Winter, my dear friend, of course, I introduced Kobe and Tex, just as I introduced Kobe to mindfulness expert George Mumford. But I used to talk with Tex about the difference between Kobe and Michael. Mm -hmm. And Tex would say, well, Michael's a little stronger in the post. This is when Kobe's a young player and Michael was, you know, playing in the 90s and lighting up the world. And Tex would say, yeah, Michael's stronger in the post down there, you know, when he posts up and get those shots off. Kobe can't quite do that yet. Michael's hands are a little bit larger. Mm -hmm. But Tex said the big difference is that Michael played for Dean Smith at North Carolina for three seasons. He learned how to be a team player, pretty much a team player, within a structured offense. Kobe had never learned that. He went straight into the NBA. So the record shows he had lots of conflict with his older teammates because he was used to – he had all this athletic talent. He could show them up in practice. 
you know, uh, he, the, he put a lot of pressure on those Lakers because he played so well, so talented. But he was so young. Mm-hmm. And uh, he really had to learn the team game with older men who were annoyed by him. And Shaq was the most annoyed. Yeah. And of course, it eventually happened. And eventually, Phil Jackson and Tex Winter went to the Lakers in the fall of 1999 to begin coaching three immediately, three straight championship teams. And then they all had a falling out and Phil and Shaq went away. And then Phil came back and Kobe won two more titles with Phil again. But the point was, Kobe never seemed to be really all that worried about public relations or what people thought. His answer to everything was to work as hard as he could to to have this blind dedication to greatness. And that's all he really concerned himself with. Okay. So th- interesting. I never knew that story. That's very interesting about uh, his father. Yes, and I spent lots of research pulling all that story out. And, uh, you know, I had lots of people explain all the different things that happened. And Showboat is in 12 languages. There's a reason it is has been translated into 12 languages, just like my Michael Jordan book's been translated into 22 languages. The idea is to explain these great players in terms of the game, but also to explain them as people. I mean, was it hard, I mean, to put all of these things together? I mean, I, I'm sure there's a lot of untold stories in your book. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. No, there are. And, uh, you know, I was there the night Kobe scored his first NBA field goal. Mm-hmm. It was in Charlotte. Yeah. The Lakers were on an East Coast swing. And Kobe hit a three-pointer. He was so excited when he did it. It had been several games he hadn't scored. And he finally scored a field goal. And I was in the locker room with my recorder and my notebook. And he came popping in the locker room and immediately hit me with a soul shake, you know, with the tug and everything. He didn't know who I was. I was some guy standing there with a microphone. Mm -hmm. But he was eager to greet the world that night. And we, you know... We got to know each other. And uh, I remember in that spring, in February, and it wasn't spring, it was February, the All-Star Game was in Cleveland, the 50th anniversary of the NBA. And I sat with him in the locker room while the slam dunk contest was getting ready to start. And we talked and talked. They had other games and things going on. And he, then he left that locker room after visiting with me and went out there and won that slam dunk contest as a rookie and ripped his shirt, you know, like he was across yeah. his chest. And uh, he was quite the guy. I was a little worried about him. I'll show you something here. Before I did Showboat, mm-hmm. I did this book on him in 1999. Okay. Oh, Mad Game, the NBA education of Kobe Bryant. Yeah, that's not a good. I wrote that in 1999. Showboat came out. Here's Showboat. Showboat came out in 2016, 17 years later. And of course, by then, Kobe was finishing his last row season. Yeah, did the, 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 the book cover that up to his last season? Pardon? Did you did you cover that? I mean, the book was it in also in the book? Yes, it came out, and then here's the uh, here's the paperback. Okay, which ESPN said was essential reading. This came out in October six, twenty sixteen, after he had finished that spring of 2016 with his 60-point game, his last game. All that's covered in the book. Oh, I can't re- wait to read it. And this is the Jordan book that came out in 2014. Mm-hmm. 
it's, this is now the 10th anniversary of it. And that's the, the paperback of both of them. Well, I haven't even finished your magic yet. Uh, lots of great stories. That's a lot of work. That <laughs> magic. But they're all long like that. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas, 700 some pages. Mm -hmm. Kobe, 600, plus, almost 700. And magic is about 750 of text and wow. keep all the notes. notes. These are very complicated stories. So some of it basketball, some of it family. Well, at least the readers are inter interested in what I'm picking out from here. But there's a lot more to do, for sure. Well, thank you. Of course. And, of course, they can, I, I'm talking to the author. <laughs> that's, that's what makes it it's better. Well, uh, a little bit. It's the next best thing, I guess, to get, talking to the players themselves. We can't talk to Kobe. Mm -hmm. And Michael doesn't make himself available to the press much anymore. Magic will do it occasionally, but your book on Kobe, those books on Kobe, were you, were you able to talk to him or get his reaction or what? What did he say well, about? Him? Well, you, you know, uh, with Michael, he shook my hand. They treated me. They'd always treated me well in Charlotte, but he he never talked about it much after the book came out. I know that one of his representatives was not happy. Uh, oh. um, but people like Luke Longley and, and Tony Kukoc and, they, and, you know, and I had various people like Steve Kerr. He spent a lot of time explaining mm -hmm. um, his relationship with Michael and all the kinds of things with Michael and the team. Different people did that, different teammates. And then um, with Kobe, he he never responded. He I'd known Kobe and talked to him forever. He was very aware when I was doing that, and and later I I messaged both of them when I started the books about them. Mm -hmm. And Magic had agreed to talk with me, but he changed his mind. But his agent and his coaches, his agent did uh, fifty different interviews with me. So he was, but I had, I had spent so much time interviewing Magic and Kobe and Michael over the years that I, I was, and like I said, Tex Winter was my guide to both Michael and Kobe. And I introduced Tex and Kobe, just as I interview, introduced George Mumford and Kobe. So I had a, a good inside view that allowed me to do a good biography. The, the Kobe book is in 12 languages, Michael Jordan in 22. And although Magic just came out, it's already uh, in eight. Schedule for eight. Uh, I have a copy of the French book around here somewhere. And the Greek publisher called me the other day to chat. He's brought out all my books. And, you know, in the Philippines, uh, in Australia, I have a, a lot of wonderful readers. They, oh, for sure. Uh, they support me. <laughs> Especially about Kobe, Michael. I mean, you met some of them already when we talked to you the last time, right? Yes, yes. And yeah, I'm sure I'm going to read that. That's going to be keeping me busy. Anyway, Sir Roland, if you don't mind, I'll also add while we still have time. Your thoughts, I mean, the playoffs are nearing. How do you see it? Well, you know, we, we got those newcomers in the picture. Uh, some of the other teams, uh, Golden State continues to have its ups and downs with uh, Draymond. A lot of the things that that were happening in the season are still happening. You know, it's uh, those things are typical as teams age. Uh, the Timberwolves, uh, you know, have risen considerably. The, the West is where a lot of that's happening. Oklahoma City and that young team is, has risen. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you're sitting there, you know, Philadelphia has had their trouble. The Celtics are cooking right along. Mm -hmm. 
Miami's had a lot of injuries, very up and down. But it's uh, it'll be interesting because sitting there in front of all of them, you got Milwaukee starting to mesh with their chemistry, but the real problem for all of them will again be Denver. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if Denver can repeat, but they certainly have the elements perhaps to do that. They're maybe not quite as good as they were, but they're still very good. Sure. Okay, your comments on LeBron's call, well, what call LeBron said earlier today about, well, he was trying to hint about retirement. Any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, LeBron is a major power player in the NBA because he's been remarkable his entire career. He's been remarkable here as he nears 40. Uh, the Lakers depend on, on him heavily. It's remarkable that he's still one of the very best players in the NBA. But uh, the point is he has to sort of remind the Lakers there are certain things he wants so he's hopeful to be on a team that is able to compete for a championship. Uh, you know, there's talk about them bringing in another top player to help sweeten the roster. And so he'll make statements that sometimes are really just messages to Lakers management about the things that he wants to see. And a great player like that has a lot of power. You know, he's put in the work. He has done everything he can. And uh, I don't think you can ever say LeBron's cheated the fans. Yeah. And the Lakers depend on him heavily, obviously. So I think uh, you, you just don't know. He's got to figure out where he wants to be. He had always wanted to be in L.A. He's there now. He's won a title there. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see because this is all about positioning for next season. Mm -hmm. When and if he is going to retire. Uh, you know, the guy looks pretty good to me. It looks to me like he could play two or three or four more seasons. Yeah. He's just, he's not only very talented, he's very smart as a player. And so he's just sort of waiting to see what's the best situation. I don't blame him. Yeah. Well, look at them right now, given their talent. Yeah. They, um, you know, they, they have some issues. Uh, they, I, I don't really know how good their chemistry is with their coach. I'm not close enough to that to really say definitively. They do make comments, but that's those things are typical around NBA teams. I think for any coach that handles the Lakers, that's going to be automatic. Well, Chuck Daly, you know, who was the dream team coach and coached the Pistons for years, told me, he said, you know, Running an NBA team is like running 12 to 15 corporations. Every player is like a corporation. And so the negotiations with all these entities, all these people have their own sort of economic power. That That's a different thing. But I think that's true whether we're talking about soccer, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, those soccer clubs, they – they they have power games played by their top players as well. That's just the nature of of the sports landscape today. Yeah. Well, let's see. It's just around the corner in the playoffs. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe we'll talk again before the playoffs. For sure, I will. For sure, we will. <laughs> Good. I look forward to it. All right, Sir Roland. Great to thank see you. you. You too. Thank you. <laughs>